Okay, so now I'm going to go on my little bit of a rah-rah cheer for dads today because dads have to learn their roles too, and there's much less preparation, there's much less effort and focus uh, placed on dads today and fathers. And if you think traditionally, not widely historically, but, you know, within the last hundred years, men and women's roles in society have been clearly defined. Men have always been the breadwinners of the family, and so a lot of, most of the time, Men are outside of the house doing their things, working outside, bringing money home. The woman's domain has typically been the household, keeping the house up, and caring for the children, raising the children. So that's what we've known in the last at least three, four, or five generations here in the United States. Okay. So now we're in a time, in 2018, we wake up and we had women's lib, and now we want men to be helpful and, uh, and help around the house and do chores and help with the babies. But we just expect poof it to happen. They didn't necessarily have fathers that did that. So it's the women's uh, role, I feel, to kind of uh, create an environment that lets fathers know that we want them to expand their role and we're here to help them do it together as a team, I guess is how I would say it. So I put this idea up here about moms and maternal gatekeeping. So this idea of maternal gatekeeping is that moms traditionally have, like I said, been in charge of the household and raising the children. So we, we have a certain way that we like to do it, and when someone steps in and tries to do it a different way, uh-uh, that's not going to work here. So you can see the picture of, you know, uh, this doesn't happen in my household, by the way. We flip roles in a lot of ways. But uh, the way you wash the dishes, if a woman likes the way she washes the dishes or even loads a dishwasher, and she's like, God, my husband never helps out. Honey, can you help out tonight? And he comes out and loads it how he loads it. She comes looking behind him. You didn't put the plates. In. So then the man's kind of feeling like he can't do anything right. It's definitely not going to encourage him to help out in the future. So moms have to be a little bit less uh, staunch of maternal gatekeepers. That you have to let men step in and do things the way they want to do it. A really good example I have is uh, in when my husband and I first got into a relationship, he, his best friend had a baby, again, one of the first in our group to have a child. So we went to visit them at the hospital, and him and his wife were there, and we were there maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes. You don't want to overstay your welcome. They're tired. You just want to say hi to them and the baby. Um, and the big thing at, for a newborn that probably most of you have heard of, the term of swaddling which pretty much means wrapping up a baby really tight in a blanket so that they feel protected and uh, still feel like they're comforted in the mother's womb. They can't flail around. Well, there's different levels and, I guess, different, uh, different ways to swaddle that you understand when you become a mom. But at the time, I didn't know. So the dad was there. He was very proud of his son, excited. He's over there swaddling, and, and the wife was in the bed. Honey, you're not swaddling the baby right. What's wrong with you? Bring him over here. And, and the dad's like, honey, I got it. I'm just going to wrap. I watched the nurse do it. And they went back and forth for probably half of our visit there, yelling about him trying to swaddle the baby right and, and him not doing it right. So finally, he just brings the baby over and sits it down, and she's over there swaddling it perfectly. And the light bulb's going off in my head thinking, you just lost help from your partner with a lot of this, that if, if he can't even do something like wrap a baby in a blanket correctly, you know what, I wouldn't want to come back the next day and try again either. So moms have to really be careful, even though it's all in us, to want things to be done the way that we want to do it, to kind of lighten up a little bit and let dad do dad how he wants to do dad. I'm saying this, and I'm still trying to practice what I preach because it's hard always to know. My husband is, lets our children be much more of a daredevil than I would. And I just gotten to the point where instead of yelling at him, I'll just turn and hold my breath and hope I don't hear screaming and just let him learn as he goes because it's got a, um, it, 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 I want him to still be involved and to think that he, to know that he's learning and that we're both learning together. So this idea of maternal gatekeeping, um, we need to kind of watch it with moms. Uh, so dads then also can support moms in her role, so anything that they can think of to do to help mom out. Um, and then Again, the way that dad's going to interact with the baby might be different from mom. My husband, is he's a big guy and he's muscular. I still don't know how he did it because I couldn't. Because when I held the babies, I was either like this or over my shoulder. He had a way to hold them where they would sit right here like they were sitting up. He was supporting their neck. But he would walk around with them just one arm like this, it, like they were in a chair. 
it would put them both immediately to sleep, or it would calm them. They'd either quit crying or calm. And I couldn't ever do it, but he did it in such a way so it got to the point at my house where I'd say, honey, I've tried everything. Can you try to put the baby, oh, yeah, I got it. And, you know, try to make your partner into a hero so they help out and they do it more. So he was always at our house walking around with the baby like that. So let me show this other little video. It, there's two that are just precious. I couldn't decide one or the other about dads being with babies and how they do it in their own unique way. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> 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 Lila, how much do you love daddy? What? What? How much? What? How much? How much? How much? That's right. Who is that, Ava? Who is that? Who is that, Ava? Who's got you? Oh, oh God. <laughs> Give daddy some kisses. <laughs> Give daddy kisses. Give me some kisses. That was cute, just a little side, the whole tossing off. You, all dads do it. My husband did it. I'm so nervous wrecked watching them toss them off. But they always catch them. I haven't seen, I'm sure I could find a video with someone not catching them. I don't want to. But that always makes me nervous.
Isn't that cute? Now would be the time where I miss you guys not being here in class because we could go around and share some things that either you've done as a father or that your partner's done as a father or that your dads did to you because they're all cute, uh, some cute examples. And I went on uh, the internet to try to find some, and there were lists and lists and lists. So at the end of class, if you're done, if you want to see, there's just so many fun, cute things they have. And it, there's just something touching with dads doing things different with their little kids how they do them. So that's cute. I'm glad I got to share those with you. Okay, and this would also be the time in class where I would pause and see you guys have any questions on what we've gone over so far. Um, so I don't know the mechanism we would have, but of course at the end of lecture, if you have any questions, there will be a way for you to email me or contact me to uh, ask questions or if you need any clarification. But this would be a good time now for us to pause and see if you guys had anything else that you wanted to share with the class. Okay, so the next topic that I want to talk about is this idea of attachment and bonding. It's the first and most important thing that new parents are going to do with their children. Um, so all of the child development theorists incorporate this idea of attachment and bonding somehow because basically what it is, it's the way that the, the baby communicates, early communication with parents. So they need to let you know that they're hungry, that they're tired, that they are... Uh, ready to play, that they're ready to engage with you. So they have to do things and that moms and dads pick up on in practice uh, that is early forms of communication. So cooing, smiling, crying, any of these types of things are, are it's pretty much mom and, uh, mom and dad talking to the child. Uh, so of course, this is going to be studied by the child development theorists. So I'll mention one or two. The first one is Erickson. Eric Erickson is a, is a human development theorist, and he, he has ideas of what happens to us as we progress through, from actually from childhood to adulthood, to late adulthood. He's the, one of the only uh, child development theorists that's an actual human development theorist that has ideas and things that happen, ideas about what happens through all stages of, of our life. Um, and Erickson pretty much says that the first task uh, for parents and children to accomplish in the first six months of a baby's life is to form a secure attachment. And that's done through bonding and, and feeling close to one another. And this happens, and it's this idea of basic trust, and it happens uh, in the mechanism that the parent correctly responds most of the time to the baby's cues, to these types of uh, early communication patterns, messages that the baby is giving to the parent. Okay. The next theorist is, uh, is a theorist by the name of Mary Ainsworth. Now, when we, when we think about attachment, you're always going to see her name listed when we talk about uh, early attachment. Her research was interesting, and I think she's most famous for how she assessed attachment. Because we might say, OK, as, as researchers, as, as uh, uh, theorists in the field of family studies, if we want to know if a child and a parent has a good attachment, well, we always want to have the follow-up question, how are we going to study that? How are we going to measure it? How are we going to assess it? So Mary Ainsworth came up with this idea, and it was called the strange situation. And I, and I, I have this chart here that's going to be the, um, the outcome. But basically what it was, it was a, a, a caretaker, most of the time it was the mother, would come into a room with uh, her infant, usually between the ages of one and two, and they would go spend time in the room, and I think that they would spend 21 minutes in the room doing a series of activities. So the mom would come in with the baby. And you can also uh, Google or YouTube this and watch this actually happen. I was going to include it, but I didn't want to have our class run too long. But she would come in with the child, and the uh, researchers or observers would watch what the baby would do in a new environment with mom present. So they had, it's like a playroom set up. So would the baby leave mom and explore around with the toys? How fearful were they? Would they hang on to mom? And then mom, and then at one point, after the, they are in the room for a few minutes, then a stranger comes in. And the stranger comes in, tries to engage with the child, with the mom still there. All the while, the observers are watching the child and seeing the child's reactions and what he or she does. Then the next sequence is mom leaves the baby alone in the room with the stranger. And so we watch what the child does. Typically, all children are going to scream, but they're looking to see how, how and if and to what extent when mom returns back in the room, she's able to calm and settle the child. So there's a whole list of things that you guys can look up on your own if you're more interested in this assessment, which is pretty cool. 
um, to look. And so basically what they do, like I said, it's 21 minutes. Um, and what they do is they observe the infant during separation with the caretaker and then again with reunion to the caretaker. And based on that, they, came, they have come up with these different attachment styles, okay? So I have my sheet here and you guys can also look. Um, but the attachment styles are 65% are securely attached, 20% are avoidant, 10 to 15 are ambivalent, and 10 to 15 are disorganized. This was, it, initially there were only three attachment styles. This, this fourth one was added later. And then you can see what happens. So across the top it says the child's general state of being. So for secure, the kids are pretty secure, they explore, they're pretty happy. Um, avoidant, they don't explore, they're kind of emotionally distant. The ambivalence are anxious, insecure, angry, a little bit more emotional. And this group is, is the most troublesome when you find this, but these children, these infants early on are depressed, angry, completely passive, non-responsive, just not typically what you would think you would see or hope to see with a child at that age, um, just exploring. And then you have this, this column right here where it's mother's responsiveness to her child's signals and needs. So how does the mom react when the child's in distress? So these moms of secure, they're quick, sensitive, consistent. The child cries, mom's there helping out. This set of group, uh, this set of uh, dyad with the avoidant children who were attached, who had the attachment style avoidant, their moms were distant or disengaged. Ambivalent, their moms were inconsistent. So sometimes they were sensitive, sometimes they were neglectful. So you really couldn't predict. These were extremely erratic. So the frightened or frightening, passive or intrusive, one of the extreme levels of either too much involvement or not any involvement at all. And the, and the involvement was not very positive. And then finally you have the fulfillment of the child's needs. So this is what the child learns from this type of, a, of attachment style or bonding uh, relationship with their parent. Secure, they believe that, they, that uh, there's trust and that his or her needs will be met. The avoidant or subconsciously believe that his or her needs probably won't be met. So they're not really sure. Um, ambivalent is they can't rely on his or her needs being met. And then these were severely confused, no strategy at all to how to have his or her needs met. Um, so you can see that the, it's, it's the back and forth. The child uh, uh, acts in a certain standing way, mom reacts, and then we can kind of see what expectations, even the infant at the age of one to two, um, learns about their relationship with their caretaker. Um, what's interesting with this research is it's been replicated longitudinally over the years. So they've looked at the children who were, who've fallen in these attachment styles over the years and they followed them into middle childhood. And they found similar results that kids that who had secure attachment had pretty happy, normal, healthy uh, relationships with their friends during middle childhood. The others who were in the not secure attachment had different types of relationships that weren't very healthy. And then they even followed these infants into young adulthood to look at their dating relationships, which is very interesting. And these light bulbs are going to go off for you guys at home. So the securely attached kids, um, they were in healthy dating relationships, you know, pretty healthy, not too, n no real big issues other than what we would expect would be normal types of issues. The avoidant ones, um, believing that his or her needs probably won't be met, well then they're probably, uh, going to be standoffish. They're not going to want to commit to a relationship. They don't want to be involved in something that they can't really depend on, and they don't think that their partner's going to be there for them. So the relationship they had with their parents is now being replicated with later uh, romantic relationships. Ambivalent ones, those are the kind of, <laughs> the, we all have girlfriends, and we all know women out there, a little bit, little bit kooky. So, uh, you know, they're overly jealous. They, they don't, um, they don't trust at all, so there's, there's a lot of drama in those relationships. And then disorganized, it could be all over the place. But the point is that these early attachment relationships that one-year-olds, that babies have, it's the most important thing that moms and dads can do is to be 100% as much as possible responsive to the baby's early communication signals. Because it not only sets the stage for that age, it goes into adulthood, okay? And then this relationship is bi-directional. So, um, if you have an infant, so if you have an infant that's needing his or her needs being met, and the mom and dad is not doing it, and the infant is acting up, 
then the cycle goes back to mom. If you're a parent with a child who isn't easily consoled or who cries a lot, it makes you feel like a crummy parent, like you're not doing something right and you're incompetent, and then it kind of can spiral downward. So the idea that the infant, the infant and his or her temperament has an impact also on how mom or dad feels like they're meeting the needs of their child is a very important point to consider. And then again, fathers. So how can we help fathers form this bond? Um, the best we can do is just have them feel involved throughout all parts of this. You know, the pregnancy, the woman carrying the baby, especially those moms who are exclusively breastfeeding, they spend a lot of time that meeting the needs of the baby and spending a lot of time with the child. Um, the best thing we can do, especially if you're working with these families, is find ways to actively and consistently involve dad into this process. Um, so, you know, for me, when I was breastfeeding, uh, my husband, he's a clean guy, so my husband actually has always done the bathroom duty, and he prefers the diaper duty, even though I do a fine job. He likes to do it a little bit better. So I, <laughs> I encourage that, and to this day, he still, for the most part, will give our kids a bath at night. Um, but, you know, breastfeeding at night, I would say, honey, you know, the baby, my son or my daughter was in the other room crying. I'd wake him up, I'd say, honey, can you please go change the diaper and just bring it back into me because you do such a good job and then you go back to bed and I'll breastfeed. So it was helping me a lot, but just having him help out and let him know that he was doing something important. Um, the whole breastfeeding process, he can sit there with you, hang out with my son. Um, when I was breastfeeding my daughter who was younger, my husband, I would always say, honey, it'd be a huge help if you could you know, hang out with Zane for a little bit, I'm going to take... Uh, LJ back in the bedroom and, and uh, breastfeed her. So any way that we can bring fathers involved into the process. Believe me, the mothers will be happy and the marriage will be better. Trust me on that. Okay. So I've mentioned this before, mom's emotional adjustment. I have the baby crying, but sometimes moms can feel like they want to cry more than the baby. Having a baby, we saw in the video, and even though I know we're done with our family, there's still part of me that fantasizes about having a third child because I think the feelings and how society celebrates a child, it's just, it's magical, it's a miracle. Um, it's, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. And every time I see the video, I cry myself. However, we don't spend enough time talking, I think, and allowing moms to talk about that it's hard, too, and that you're going to have these feelings. So you come home thinking, oh, I should be the best mom. I should be so happy and grateful for my child. Why am I feeling exhausted? Um, like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I'm lonely. There are feelings that all moms have, but I don't think we talk about them enough to let the moms know that it's okay, that all moms feel this way, too. So as a lactation consultant, you're going to be interacting with these new moms having all these feelings. I would suggest one of the best things you can do is just, this is a lot of work, isn't it? You even come out of the gate with it. And just let them know that there's an open area for them to talk with you if they want, that you're not their professional counselor, of course. But you're there to be the, kind of the initial person they could come to that's all about any information or baby information they need, um, breastfeeding or non-breastfeeding, really. And so moms are going to be feeling this way. And I'm going to show another little video that's cute. This, this video I'm going to show, well, I'll explain it after. Or no, I'll explain it now. <laughs> it's two moms, and they started on Facebook. And I don't know how long they've been on Facebook. But since I've had my second daughter, two years, I've been seeing them pop up. And um, they have, uh, I don't know how many children they have. But their thing is, you know, giving it to moms real. You know, they don't. They're in a car most of the time, and they're just talking about things that are real. And it's really personally been helpful to me. And me and my mom friends share these things because it's doing what I'm telling you, letting other moms know that this is just hard work, and we need to acknowledge it. And so just two weeks ago, one of my girlfriends went to one of, they have a show now. So this is new and interesting. It's a way that we can make money in our field, I guess. Um, they have such a following that now they're doing tours around, and they have like a mommy show where they, I think they basically just sit up on the stage and talk about mommy stuff, but they also, they serve alcohol there, they serve cocktails, 
Um, they have male dancers come in. They have female flamenco dancers come in. So it's like just a big getaway for moms for the night. But it's kind of celebrating and talking about the hard stuff that moms go through that we don't talk about enough. I'm going to try to turn the volume up for us. Let's find it. Hang on, guys. Okay, right was there. Sorry. To fantasize about what it would be like to be a mom with a baby, and you dream about your baby just lying beside you in your bed so quietly. The baby is just so so perfect and beautiful. Hey, Serena, you've got it together. You're walking down the street looking all fine, and you're just pushing your perfect baby in your perfect stroller like it's no big deal. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Guess what? There's a reality check. It's it called show. Never, ever, 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 ever in our whole entire lives did we ever think having a baby, our first baby, would be that hard. Try looking so freaking gorgeous when you're on two hours of sleep and there's a baby crying in your ear. Before we had a baby, we never knew when they said, you're tired. As a mom, when you're tired, that means no sleep. They also don't tell you that coffee becomes like an a, a, like an addiction. Like it's not like you just like need a cup. You need the whole damn jug. You never knew that at the end of the day, when your husband asks you, "What did you do today?" You want to punch him in the face? I well, have what? No did you idea what you did all day. But what you're you exhausted. Mean? What do you mean? What did I do all day? What did? But what did you do all day? I know what did you do all day. I have no idea what I did all day. Walking was my day. I would wake up. I would figure out the schedule. I would walk. I even practiced. I remember we practiced sleep training. I never knew you had to practice how to like how to sleep train. We would sit in the room. You told me sit in the room, Catherine. Hold the baby one snap time. Put the baby down. Pick the baby up. And then when the baby doesn't nap, go and. I never knew that I would have to go to these like play dates with moms who I would never choose to be my fr friends and hang out with I'm them. Sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> sorry, I'm that bad. <laughs> Didn't know. Okay, thanks for the memo and the mum truth. I never knew that a, a little tyrant like that could upheave my life so much. No one ever told me that I wouldn't know what to do with a baby. Morse mother's instinct. I thought I would just know. There's no mother's instinct. There's a freaking handbook. Never did you know that having a shower was a vacation. Driving in the car alone was a vacation. Anything alone is a vacation. And a luxury is your hair, your nails, a tiny sleep in, like more than four hours, five hours, that becomes a luxury. I thought that my husband and I would just know the rules. Like, I thought that you would just figure it out. It's not how it is. Never knew I would feel crazy, and I never knew that I thought well, my baby would be crazy. I never knew you would both feel crazy. I never knew that I would just start crying, actually crying. And if someone said, why are you crying? I, don't I actually don't know. The only time know. I cried before was over a boy, and it was stupid. <laughs> I never knew my boobs get so big. Never, ever, ever did I ever dream of that. I never knew that nipples look like udders when you pump. It's disgusting. <laughs> Not sure what they do to deserve your love so much because you just love them. They do nothing but cause wreak havoc, but you love them. And you see them and you're like, oh, I want more of that. Like, it's crazy. It is self-destructive behavior, but it, it's amazing. I'm not Hard. saying it was hell. I'm saying it wasn't not magical. It was not serene. It was not pristine. It wasn't a Disney movie. What did we do to deserve those those things? I don't understand. We asked for it. We did? We asked for those babies. No, I know, but who, who programmed them to make them little moms? You know, if I were to design a baby, yeah, I'd design a baby. Now I know. Yeah, I would make them cute. Yes, all of them. I, I'm okay with that. They poop, they pee. That's normal. Yeah, I can wait. But back. when I put them to sleep at night or at nap time, they go to sleep until yes. I get back. Yeah. No, you're not leaving the house. But like, so you come upstairs. Yeah, like, what are you waking up? I told you to sleep. <laughs> you know, we really worked hard for all those babies. We had seven of them between the two of us, and <laughs> there was a lot of tears. <laughs> there was a lot of conversations. But we're done now. Are we? I mean, we're done. Like, the kids are grown. Well, unless we have another. It's free to subscribe, and we will entertain you. Yeah. For free. For free. I'm going to guess. You don't even, you don't Let's even. Let's go to the comments. <laughs> they're cute, hon. Uh, they're, uh, they don't mind cussing a little bit, as you can see. It bleeps out. But, they, I mean, they really tell it, honestly, how a lot of moms feel. Um, I'm a mom of that nature that I t would talk like them. But even moms who wouldn't talk like them, who are a little bit more 
uh, buttoned up. I think they would appreciate moms who are not as buttoned up, just saying this is a lot of work and it's hard. I like that one. They're, they're fun. They're, their names are Cat and Nat. Okay, so I'm setting this up to say that this is hard. So if you're going to be working with new moms, um, not that you would be in a position to counsel them, but be aware of some things that you might see in case you need to offer uh, some advice or some resources for them. So all uh, 50 to 80 percent of moms may experience something called the baby blues. So this begins two to three days after delivery. It may last a few weeks. A condition a little bit more serious is the idea of postpartum depression. So this is 50, 15 to 20 percent of moms may experience this. There are certain signs, um, and I wrote a list of things that you might see. Uh, mood changes, loss of pleasure, guilt at feeling like they're failing as a mom or feel, failing as a wife, extreme fatigue, poor concentration, just something's not on or right with them. The, all of the symptoms I suggest that I just mentioned, occasionally for short periods I think would be normal for most moms, but over a prolonged work, that's kind of been the common um, feeling that she's been having, that you've been seeing her have, and that would be maybe a little bit more cause for concern. So this is pretty much your role down here, is to be able to kind of note these symptoms and maybe an awful, offer her a referral to services uh, that she could see someone to talk about these issues if, if they are more serious. And I know just recently, and this is an idea, this again, an extreme idea of postpartum depression, why would you be depressed at such a happy time? We're hearing more and more uh, celebrities come out, uh, professional people, that this topic is being talked about a lot more, I would say, in the last decade or two, which is a very good, healthy thing. That if moms are going through this, they shouldn't feel bad about needing to go seek help, which I think is a common thing for this condition, actually a common thing for mental illness in our family, in our uh, families today. 